Hi, my name is Deborah Widas, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research at the Maurer School of Law. Thank you for joining us today at the annual Ralph F. Fuchs Lecture. And I will say that this is, of course, the first time we are doing this lecture over Zoom, but a silver lining of the current situation is that we have audience members from all over the country. The Fuchs Lectureship in Law was established in 1993 to honor the memory of Professor Ralph Fuchs, a distinguished and respected member of our faculty from 1945 until his death in 1985. Professor Fuchs was an accomplished teacher and a pioneering scholar in the area of administrative law. He was equally well known for his lifelong commitment to public service and for the dedication, creativity, and compassion he brought to that work. He was the first chairman of the executive board of the Indiana Civil Liberties Union and active in the local NAACP. He was also deeply committed to defending the rights of free speech, free press, and free assembly in the university context, eventually becoming president of the American Association of University Professors. The yearly Fuchs Lecture is a cornerstone of our public interest program, which also includes our live client clinics and pro bono projects, many of our vibrant student organizations, and our access to justice program. Each year, we recognize the thousands of hours of pro bono legal services provided by our students. They do this entirely as volunteers, receiving neither credit nor pay, but their work makes a tremendous difference to those who need legal services most. Past Fuchs lecturers have included some of the nation's top lawyers and legal scholars with deep commitments to public service. They include William B. Gould, former chairman of the National Labor Relations Board, Morris Dees, civil rights lawyer and co-founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center, Jerry King, UCLA law professor and the founding vice chancellor for equity, diver diversity and inclusion at UCLA, Tracy Mears, Hamilton professor of law at Yale Law School and the founding director of the Justice Collaboratory at Yale, and Lee Gallant, deputy director of the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project. It is an honor to add to that distinguished list today's speaker, Professor Mary Wood, the Philip H. Knight Professor at the University of Oregon School of Law. And it is now my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague, Rob, Rob Fishman, to tell us more about Professor Wood's many accomplishments. Okay, thank you, Professor Wydas. In a few minutes, we will hear from Professor Wood, who will give her lecture entitled On the Eve of Destruction, the Role of Courts in the Climate Emergency. Um, but what I'd like to do before that is just to say a little bit about who Professor Wood is. Uh, and I guess what I would say is that she's a rare triple threat in academia. What I mean by that is uh, she excels as a scholar, as an activist, and as an institution builder. As a scholar, her, her articles date back to 1988. And in, in reviewing her very first article on the Clean Water Act, I was struck by the similarity between the, uh, one of the theories she advances and the approach adopted by Justice Breyer in last April's Supreme Court decision, the County of Maui case. So uh, even before Professor Wood got involved in trust doctrines, she was talking about the functional equivalent of direct discharges as a basis for Clean Water Act regulation. But she's certainly better known for her work on trust doctrines which were rooted originally in a series of influential articles on the obligation that the federal government has for Indian tribes. From there, would scholarship uh, turn to the public trust in water? She's uh, uh, also written on the public trust over wildlife conservation on behalf of the people. And uh, finally, her work on the public trust doctrine uh, I would say, you know, has culminated in the past several years uh, with thinking about the issues associated with the way in which we manage the atmosphere as a common resource in trust for everybody. And her magnum opus, Nature's Trust, I guess this is the uh, occult edition uh, that you secretly need a mirror to read, but uh, Nature's Trust, the 2014 book, uh, well, it is partly what you expect it to be, which is um, 
uh, a uh, description of, of how one can apply this, this very ancient doctrine to the, the contemporary challenge of climate change. But it's also partly what you might not expect it to be, which is a condemnation of uh, the way we teach environmental law in schools and the way the EPA practices environmental law. And so, it's, you know, simply as a critique of environmental law, it's very powerful. And she'll be talking quite a bit about the extension of the trust to the atmosphere. Now, if it had been me, I would have been content to write a book and then let a, a thousand, let it launch a thousand lawsuits. But Professor Wood is not that uh, type of, uh, of of a person. And as an activist, you know, she's been involved in a very diverse array, array of, of of groups, including Oregon Trout Climate Legacy Initiative, the Center for Environmental Law and Policy and especially the Western Environmental Law Center, which is a real uh, litigation powerhouse. And uh, as a result, her fingerprints are behind a lot of the lawsuits she's gonna be talking about over the course of the lecture. Finally, in addition to being a scholar and an activist, Professor Wood is an institution builder. Uh, she has long served as the faculty director of the legendary environmental and natural resources law program at the University of Oregon. John Bonine, who's the spiritual father of that program, calls her a real inspiration, which is an assessment I confirmed through a series of uh, secret emails with her colleagues at the University of Oregon. Uh, so, uh, as you uh, enjoy her lecture, keep in mind that she's uh, someone who is able to bridge theory with, uh, with practice and uh, with legal education. With that, then, I'd like to welcome to Maurer School of Law, Professor Mary Wood. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rob, for that amazing introduction. And I just want to say I am so honored uh, to have been chosen for this Fuchs lecture and to carry out this legacy of such a remarkable person. And I express tremendous gratitude to the School of Law for organizing it and really to the work of my wonderful colleague, um, Professor Fishman. So I wish I had time to uh, recount your scholarship, but I'm going to launch right in. My lecture will address the role of the courts in the climate emergency. And before I do that, I just want to dedicate my remarks to the millions of Americans now who have come face to face with the horrors of the climate reality. Um, these are people who have fled their homes in the middle of the night, trying to escape a wildfire racing towards them or have evacuated ahead of a category five hurricane, maybe not for the first time or who are witnessing their treasured homelands eroding into the rising seas. These are people and a growing number every day who know the climate reality in a personal and very visceral way. And I just want to acknowledge them at the outset. So what I will do today right now is share my screen and hope that this will all work. And, uh, <clears throat> launch right in. What I propose to do is put together a story, beginning with our climate reality, and then talk about what the founders intended in terms of institutions to prevent tyranny in this country. I will go into then the story of how statutory law, I believe, brought us to this very moment of climate crisis, and talk about the Juliana case, which is a case brought on behalf of 21 youth plaintiffs challenging the entire fossil fuel system of the United States of America. And then I will finish with the court's role in climate crisis, putting all of that together. So let's begin with a very simple premise that the common law is supposed to address harm. It's supposed to address our reality. And so we really can't talk about the law without addressing first, what is our reality? Because if we don't match the law with our reality, it will be irrelevant. Now, I love to quote, and I almost always quote this one person, um, Orrin Lyons, who reflects tribal wisdom that goes back millennia. 
And he says, the thing you have to understand about nature and natural law is there's no mercy. There's only law. And so when I teach or speak, I always speak of the supreme laws of nature. Our environmental laws do not override those supreme laws of nature. The best we can do is hope to understand them and bring our laws in accordance with those supreme laws of nature. And yet we're not doing that. In fact, we're going the opposite direction because as Elizabeth Colbert says, we are in essence a society that uh, is in the process of destroying ourselves because of the failure to confront those natural systems. And so I'll begin with our climate reality. And it's always funny to me, people say, oh, you know, you can skip the climate stuff, just get into the law. But no, climate law is half climate and half law. We have to understand this reality to be relevant. And so the leading scientists say, we need to achieve, come back down to 350 parts per million of atmospheric carbon dioxide. That that's the highest possible level that is safe for the planet and its inhabitants. And yet we are soaring past that. We are now at 410 parts per million atmospheric carbon dioxide, largely because of fossil fuel emissions that spew carbon dioxide and also methane into the atmosphere. Now I will talk about the Juliana versus United States case later, but what I wanna do is just pluck from it a few factual um, quotes um, from the opinion. This is stuff that the Ninth Circuit um, uh, Court of Appeals put out there as, as the climate reality that our atmospheric carbon levels have skyrocketed to levels not seen for almost 3 million years, that this will wreak havoc on the climate system if it continues to go unchecked and that the growth shows no signs of abating. Now this will lead to an uninhabitable planet according to the, the scientists around the world. It is projected that business as usual will bring us to a temperature rise of 11 degrees Fahrenheit over pre-industrial temperatures. And the bottom line is that is not survivable on a broad scale. Now that is a harsh reality that we have to come to terms with because it affects people living today. In fact, a child born today is expected if things don't change to endure this increased temperature and climate, climate disruption until it reaches 11 degrees by the end of the century and maybe much earlier. One of nature's laws that is really the most formidable to me is the law of dangerous feedback loops. And let me just try to explain this. When we heat the world past a certain point, there are certain processes of nature that kick in that we have no control over. And those processes then put us into runaway heating. Now there are many such processes and these are triggered by what scientists call tipping points. But let me just explain one simple one that's easy to understand. There's permafrost covering the Northern latitudes and it contains vast amounts of carbon dioxide and methane. When it melts, it emits those greenhouse gases straight into the atmosphere. If you look at this picture, it has already started to melt. And scientists warn that we are on the verge of a permafrost collapse. Now, if that really gets going, there is nothing we can really practically do to avoid runaway heating. We must stay on the safe side of these tipping points. And so the UN, uh, United Nations chief expressed it this way just last year. He said, the point of no return is no longer over the horizon. It is in sight and hurtling towards us. The Juliana panel recognized the same thing, that we are approaching the point of no return. And what does that mean? It means the destabilizing climate, absent some action, will bury cities, spawn life-threatening disasters, and jeopardize critical food and water supplies. Now, the UN chief two years ago said we had to do these things to avoid these tipping points and these dangerous thresholds. First, we had to start bending the curve of emissions down by 2020, it was rising. COVID came along and did that. It forced an abrupt decrease of carbon emissions by 8%. I don't think it would have happened otherwise. We have to carry that decrease down 45% by 2030. We have to achieve a 45% decrease in emissions in 10 years and then achieve full decarbonization by 2050. And so this means we have to keep fossil fuels in the ground because if you look at this figure, there's no way to continue our path of fossil fuel, the fossil fuel energy system 
and still say, stay on the safe side of those tipping points. So we have to have systemic change in our energy system. And yet our energy system has been developed over decades to promote fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. And the Juliana panel recognized that. The We Are a Nation is expanding this fossil fuel extraction four times faster than any other nation. And the, the government promotes this use. It doesn't just sit back and watch things happen. It promotes the fossil fuel energy system through subsidies, through approving leases on federal lands and permits for exports. And so I've put a lot out on the table. Let me just provide what I always think is a pretty good analogy. Back in the Obama years, <clears throat> The president's science advisor was John Holdren, and he said this about the climate crisis. The current situation of the world in relation to the climate problem is that we're in a car with bad brakes driving towards a cliff in the fog. Now we have another driver, and that driver has his foot down on the accelerator to get to that cliff as fast as he can. And so he came in, President Trump came in on a platform of developing $50 trillion of fossil fuel development. And that is exactly what his administration is pursuing. And so when you think about the point of time we're in, nature has vested our president with unfathomable power because he happens to be president right at the last point where there's a window of opportunity to pull back. As Judge Staten said, a Ninth Circuit judge on the panel in the Giuliani case, the government bluntly insists that it has the absolute and unreviewable power to destroy this nation. And so as we move through this talk, please keep in mind that the climate emergency is something different. There's no equivalent. The courts would call this sui generis. It's not like other cases. So now we're going to turn to the second part of my talk, which is what did the founders put up as a bulwark against tyranny? Well, <clears throat> quite a few things, but I'm gonna talk about three. First, the separation of powers between the branches of government. I'll talk about the unique role of courts, and then I'll go into the rule of law. And so starting with the first, we have three branches of government. We have only three branches of government. We don't have four, we have three and they are the legislative, executive, and judicial branch. And each one plays a role. The legislature is supposed to make the law, the executive is supposed to implement the law, and then the courts are supposed to determine what the law is and enforce the fundamental rights of citizens. Now back, even as far back as Marbury versus Madison, which is a famous Supreme Court case, the court said, the court, the Supreme Court said, the judiciary has the unique and singular duty to declare what the constitutional rights are of the citizens or the fundamental rights and to curb political acts from the other branches that would curb or would violate those rights. And throughout history, there have been times when government, the political branches have violated rights systemically. And these have gone to the courts and these are very complex cases and they last for possibly decades but they fall into a different category of case than the standard case. These are not win-loss cases like a divorce proceeding or a contract dispute. These are cases that last a long time because they're trying to address long-standing violations that are literally baked into an institutional system. And so these cases, the most familiar ones to people would be the desegregation cases that achieved busing to desegregate schools. Um, but in this region, the treaty rights litigation that tried to assure a fair share of fish for treaty fishers. And there's others with respect to the prison uh, conditions and public desegregation of housing. And so these cases, what I want to say is these cases position the courts in a very different role. These are not win-loss cases, they're engagement cases where the courts actually engage with the institutions that are the defendants to correct these long-standing constitutional violations. And we'll see the climate cases fall into this category. Now, what do courts do to try to remedy a long-standing violation? Well, first they hold a bifurcated um, trial process. So they first hold a trial on the liability to determine if there's been a violation of the rights. And then they'll have a whole new trial on the remedy portion because that takes a lot of experts, a lot of fact-finding, 
a lot of vetting possible remedies. They will set uh, the sidewalls of the remedy through what we call a declaratory judgment. And that basically means they, the courts say what the constitution requires or what the fundamental rights require. They will occasionally issue what I call backstop injunctions, which means stop the violation as it's occurring. But that won't take care of the institutional uh, recalcitrance. You have to create a remedy to reform the institution enough so they won't continue to violate the rights. And so courts come up with what are called structural injunctions. And that's a legal term. Basically, it means they're trying to help that institution achieve broad institutional reform so that they don't continue to violate the rights of citizens. And this usually means that the judges will ask those defendants in the political branches, usually the agencies, the executive branch, to come to the court and create a plan, a remedial plan. And so the, the defendants themselves create the plan. It is subject to supervision by the court. But this is a very key point because in this stage of remedy, the courts exercise what I call comedy deference to the other branches. Now, this is not a term that you've seen before because no one has really zoned in on it, but it is the linchpin to, to what we're talking about with the court's role in climate crisis. In other words, when courts review a proposed remedy by the defendant uh, institutions, <clears throat> they, they assign the work to those political branches to come up with policy measures and corrective actions that will remedy these violations. The judges don't come up with the policy actions. They assign that homework to the political branches. This is work that the political branches should have been doing all along, but didn't until they were sued. Now, when the defendants come forth with that, it is subject to the court's review, of course, using the principles in the declaratory judgment to see if these remedies will achieve constitutional compliance. So what this does basically is it uses the courts to force productive attention on these violations by the agencies who have had these violations basically baked into their system for decades. And the court will set time-based milestones. They'll say, uh, the judges will say, come back <clears throat> in three months with the draft plan, come back in six months with this or this. Um, if they find uh, something is inadequate, they'll give a certain time frame to, to correct that and come back. And during this process, enormous judicial work takes place. And sometimes judges enlist uh, what we call judicial masters to, to try to handle the case with them. But the judges in the court vet the remedies. They are putting their intellectual rigor into this process as well. And they are um, holding trials to determine what the experts think about the remedies. They're also, and this gets lost um, in the discussion, they're also forging the areas of agreement between the parties. And often there's tremendous areas of agreement. And so that is the role of the courts in these really complex, thorny institutional problems. Now let's just uh, finish up this section with the rule of law. Courts apply the rule of law and we could talk about all sorts of things there. I wanna focus on the public trust because it's something people um, are less familiar with. <clears throat> the public trust is an ancient and fundamental principle that has been in this country since its inception because it dates back to actually ancient Rome. It's very simple to understand. And the Juliana case has a public trust claim. Um, it basically says that the nation has an ecological endowment for present and future generations. These are the resources that are so critical to our survival and well-being that they must be sustained. And so it appoints government as the trustee of these natural assets. And we, the citizens, along with future generations, are the beneficiaries. Government must act on our behalf, not on corporations' behalf, because it is we, the public, who own these resources, and government is a trustee. So government has a very firm fiduciary obligation to sustain this endowment so that it will support society into the future. Many scholars say this is a, a, a doctrine with constitutional underpinnings. It's like the slate upon which all constitutions are, are written. And Professor Gerald Torres says, these are inherent rights that predate the constitution and other courts have found the same. And the logic here is really that the, um, 
courts are enforcing pre-existing inherent rights. So government does not give power to the people. In America, the people give power to government. That is the logic of a democracy. People give power to the government. And when they give power, they don't give all the power to the government. They retain and reserve certain inherent and indefeasible rights. And this has been expressed by courts. And one of those rights is to not allow their government, not empower their government to give away the resources necessary for the citizens' survival and well-being. The citizens hold those back. The government can't give those away. But this principle, which has constitutional force, can only be effective if it is enforced by the courts. And again, moving back to what I just mentioned, the courts have that unique role in the constitutional democracy. They are assigned the duty to enforce fundamental rights of citizens. Well, the case that is really the seminal case in this area dates back to the 1800s when the state of Illinois literally uh, conveyed the shoreline of Lake Michigan to a railroad company, a private railroad company. And this was shoreline that the citizens needed for fishing and navigation and commerce, and yet it fell into the hands of this private railroad company because the legislature was probably corrupt and handing off public resources to its allies in industry. And so the Supreme Court of the United States said, no, you can't do that. This belongs to the public. The conveyance is invalid. It has always been held in public trust. And in fact, conveyance of the shoreline would be a grievance which never could be long born by a free people. So this is a principle that is fundamental to the tenets of our democracy. I'm gonna move now quickly into the third segment of my lecture. And I'm putting together a story for you that culminates with the Juliana case. And this third component is against our climate reality, against the bulwarks of, of democracy that are supposed to protect against one branch grabbing too much power in a tyrannical way. We've put those out on the table. Now we're gonna go to, how do we get to this climate crisis? It never should have happened. And, and it, I believe it started with the statutory laws that were passed in the 1970s with all good intentions. And these were passed in the wake of Earth Day and they had laudable purposes. They were the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act and all of those that are so familiar to us. But these statutes gave vast discretion to agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency to implement them and carry out their mandates. So far, so good. Nobody probably predicted what would happen, but the industry, the private industry that was really gearing up and needed and all of a sudden was forced to face regulation, immediately tried to influence those agencies. And ultimately over time, they captured these agencies. And the most powerful industry of all in my mind is the fossil fuel industry. Well, how do you capture an agency? The industries lobby the agencies on a daily basis, but they also give campaign contributions to presidents and governors on the state level who then speak, who then carry out their appointment roles to favor those injury, uh, industries. And so what often happens is the president will appoint industry captains who came straight from industry as agency heads. And these agency heads become political operatives. And you can look at the staffing in the Trump administration to see how this works. But you can go back to any president in the United States, even though the Trump administration took it to a new level. This has been going on for decades. So when you have a captured agency, and that alone is a big story, a, a very detailed story. But when you've got that, then the staff in that agency become sort of compelled to use the permit structure in the statutes to favor industry. So every statute almost has a permit provision that allows the very destruction that the law was designed to prevent. And what happens is the agency has this discretion to issue permits to destroy these resources. And what happened over time is issuing permits became the norm because industry had such a grip on these agencies, actually just captured the agencies. And so these laws that were so protective at the outset became tools allowing basically legal, legalized destruction through the permit system. And I've chronicled all this in my book, Nature's Trust. 
And so that is why after 50 years, the Clean Air Act still has not been used to comprehensively regulate greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, environmental laws across the board are used to promote this fossil fuel industry. Now, going back to our bulwark of democracy, we had three branches of government. Where was Congress during this whole time? Where was Congress? Congress is the boss in some sense of the agencies. Congress is the primary trustee actually. Where was it? It was missing in action because of all of the fossil fuel contributions flowing into congressional races. And so Congress actually has not stepped in to address the climate crisis at all. And during this time, where was the public? Well, the public was the subject of a very concerted disinformation campaign, misinformation campaign by the industry to try to convince the public that this was all a hoax, that climate didn't actually, climate crisis, climate threats didn't actually exist. Now that is really behind us now, but we cannot minimize the very severe impact that had on our democracy because the public was left in a, quite a confused state for a long time. Now, I'm just gonna put up three um, sort of representative sample documents. You can go back into the Juliana docket and find um, hundreds of documents, evidence that the government knew all along for decades that the fossil fuel system would, would bring us to the point we are at right now. But I'm just gonna give you a little sampling like this letter um, to President Nixon by a top aide in 1969, talking about the dangers of sea level rise, saying goodbye New York, goodbye Washington for that matter. Or this letter from a uh, Senate subcommittee saying that we are very possibly altering the ability of our atmosphere to perform basic life support functions. Or a particular quote I like from uh, Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu in the Obama administration, who told the press, I don't think the American public is gripped in its gut what could happen. We're looking at a scenario where there's no more agriculture in California. I don't actually see how they can keep their cities going either. And so the point is that there is a rather shocking record of the federal government, both the presidents and the agency heads and Congress ignoring this problem, sort of putting it off. And you can kind of, you know, psychologically, you can kind of put yourselves in their shoes for a while and think, well, this was all supposed to come down in catastrophe around 2015. And in 2080, you know, put yourselves in their minds. That that's probably seemed like a while, while away, especially 2000, uh, uh, 1980, I meant, or 1960. Um, but as it got closer, it became more in that, that, that window of what was ahead. And during this time, the fossil fuel industry kept influencing government so that it promoted this fossil fuel system and lost the decades that it could have spent in a very orderly transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. So decades were squandered. You might wonder, you know, how did we get here? We got here because all these decades were lost because of that industry's grip on government. And so when we think about the role of courts, we're not in a desirable situation at all. The courts, courts shouldn't have to come in. The problem is, that the political branches have pushed us to this moment that we're in today. So <clears throat> during this statutory time, I, I just wanna pause and talk about the role of the courts because something very dramatic happened to the judiciary during the statutory period, which started in 1970. And that is that all the environmental conflicts out there were brought in cases, where they were brought in cases, they were brought as statutory cases. And these statutes became to define the whole field. And these are very narrow claims that are brought to court under the statutes. And the courts give a lot of deference to the agencies to both interpret the law, that's called Chevron deference, but also to bring forth their expertise in permit decisions. And so courts throughout this process were giving so much deference to the agencies. And when the plaintiffs won against the agencies, when there was a violation, the courts would just simply remand the whole matter to the agencies back to the very agency that had the perhaps flawed process that brought about the violation in the first place. And so over decades of just 
uh, processing these narrow statutory cases and giving deference, the judicial branch became very passive in the environmental realm and thought of all environmental conflict as just sort of a statutory conflict. And this led with Congress missing an action and then the courts becoming passive, this led to a vacuum of power and the executive branch and all of its agencies under every president grabbed up that power and gained this unprecedented control over the nation's most vital resources that we rely on for survival. So now I have come to the point where I'm gonna talk about the Juliana case. Juliana versus United States is a case that was brought on behalf of 21 youth plaintiffs against multiple federal agencies, the, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Transportation, the Environmental Protection Agency and so forth, Department of Interior, all the federal agencies that have a role in this energy policy. And it was brought in the Federal District Court of Oregon. It is a federal case, but it is also part of a field of cases that was launched by Our Children's Trust in 2010 called Atmospheric Trust Litigation. And that sought to position the climate crisis as a matter of, um, of violating fundamental rights of youth, that these weren't statutory claims at all. It was too late to bring those statutory claims. They would never work in time, they're too micro. And so these were more macro cases taking on the system head on and calling the courts to come up and stop the fossil fuel um, destruction before it put us over the tipping points. And so this was the federal case, but there's state cases, there's also global um, cases in other nations. And this case is called the biggest case on the planet because it challenged the entire fossil fuel system of the United States of America. The complaint assembles uh, facts going back decades, showing that the government knew all along that this climate catastrophe would start coming down on us in just about this time or five years earlier and everything is really on the predictions. And they allege that the defendants showed deliberate indifference to the peril they knowingly created. Again, putting forth this story. Now, the Juliana case is the first of its kind in the United States, because what it did was it took a, a was basically an ecological issue, climate is, and it positioned it as a violation of a fundamental right. And remember in the chapter on statutory law, I said, you know, the courts were just used to processing all these environmental cases as statutory cases. And it really didn't solve anything. This case presents it as a civil rights action, a, a question of the, the children's fundamental rights to a stable climate system that they need for their survival. And so the claims were based in substantive due process and equal protection under the constitution and also a public trust claim saying that the federal government as trustee had the duty to prevent substantial impairment of the climate system and it was not fulfilling that duty. Now the remedies sought were very classic, um, characteristic of institutional litigation. Again, we're dealing with not a statutory case, a civil rights case. So the plaintiff sought declaratory relief. <clears throat> that is they wanted a court to, to determine what the rights were. And second, if they did have the right to a stable climate system, they wanted a judicial decree, again, very characteristic of institutional litigation, that would um, force the government to create a plan, a science-based plan, not a politicized plan, but a science-based plan to bring the national energy system into compliance. And that means phase out fossil fuel energy that is causing this havoc. And so, the, the U.S. District Court of Oregon came out and denied the government defendant's motion to dismiss. So the government was trying to throw the case out and Judge Ann Aiken said no, that this case is viable. She said, this is no ordinary lawsuit. It is a civil rights action. So just off the bat, the court understood this is an institutional case. This is not a statutory case. And Judge Aiken declared constitutional rights that were grounded in both the due process clause and the public trust principle. And specifically, she said, I have no doubt that, that the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is fundamental to a free and ordered society. So with that, 
a trial was set. Again, nothing unusual because once you have a declaration of rights, the next step is a trial. And this was called the trial of the century because it would have been the first time ever that the fossil fuel energy system would have confronted climate science in court. And it was set for October 29th, 2018. Now everybody expected and the court signaled that it would um, conduct this as a bifurcated trial, that it would address liability first, whether or not the government had violated the plaintiff's rights to a stable climate system, that is what it had just declared, but then go into the remedy and hold a separate trial on the remedy. So the remedy phase is a separate phase altogether with separate fact finding. And the plaintiffs had assembled experts and declarations that actually showed pathways for deep decarbonization. And they had even brought forth economists saying that this would make sense, economic sense. And so they had all this evidence ready to go on the remedy phase. And the court was prepared to assemble that evidence and, and vet it. All of these court filings, by the way, are compiled by the marvelous uh, Sabin Center at Columbia Law School. I cannot say enough good things about that center. The entire docket is there for you to go, go and search through. But what happened was the Trump administration lawyers did everything they could to prevent the plaintiffs from actually having the trial. They made unprecedented efforts, which is another chapter that I'll just have to skip because of time. But they made unprecedented efforts to derail the trial. Now, this led to a premature appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's the next level of review. And it is imperative to understand the way our system works. First, our legal system has a trial so that the judges can develop the facts in a record. And only after that time is it supposed to go up on appeal to an appellate body like the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the reason that we have that system in place is because we want the trial judges to do the work so that we don't have a situation of a hypothetical case going up to the Ninth Circuit, because that would position the Ninth Circuit or any circuit court to render an advisory opinion, which the law disdains. Now, in this case, there was a premature appeal to the Ninth Circuit. The Trump administration lawyers got what they wanted, but there was no fact-finding work by the trial court to set the record and particularly not any work to show what a viable remedy might look like. And, and there was no opportunity because there was no trial for the court to come in and exercise what I call comedy deference, that deference during a remedy stage where the court sort of figures out its role in the scheme of things and puts the policymaking function to the other branches of government who are defendants. There was no opportunity for that because it went straight up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, as the, the, the youth plaintiffs were waiting for a court hearing, the Paradise Fire uh, destroyed in California, destroyed that whole town, destroyed 18,000 homes. And the plaintiffs put forth a motion for emergency injunction filed in the Ninth Circuit to stop 100 projects that the Trump administration had ready to go. And those 100 projects really... Um, brought forward the question, could these projects alone blow through what scientists say is the remaining small space in the atmosphere for carbon dioxide pollution before we go over tipping points? They talk about the budget, the climate budget or the atmosphere's budget for further um, carbon dioxide emissions. And could these projects blow that budget for the world? Well, that <clears throat> motion for injunction was on the table and the hearing focused on the remedy. And the remedy that a court can provide really gets at what the question of what is the court's role in this separation of powers that I described to you when I talked about the bulwarks against tyranny, um, the bulwarks of democracy. What is the court's role in the scheme of things? And this comes down to two legal questions that I'm not gonna parse out right now, um, but they, they were prominent in the opinion that was ultimately rendered by the, the, um, the Ninth Circuit. And they're called the political question doctrine and just disability. And primarily the opinion focused on the latter. Can the court um, issue a remedy? The majority opinion, um, the, the, uh, the panel, I should say, was split. There were three judges on the panel and two formed the majority and one formed the dissent. And the opinion came out on January 17th, 2020. And Judge Hurwitz 
wrote the opinion for uh, himself and Judge Murguia. And he started the opinion with this amazing phrase, that we're on the eve of destruction. They recognized that. They also recognized the government was pushing us towards environmental apocalypse. They recognized that the plaintiffs might have viable constitutional claims. And yet they said reluctantly, we conclude that such relief is beyond our constitutional power, beyond it. And so they recognized the viability of the case, but they refused to recognize any role granting relief. They found no scenario would meet the redressability test. That is no scenario where they could grant relief, not declaratory relief, not in joining the 100 projects, not creating a remedial plan. And I think this is really in retrospect, the pitfall of a hypothetical case going up to the Ninth Circuit. They, they were worried that the court would invade the policy prerogatives of the other branches of government, specifically the executive, but they had absolutely no record to actually analyze that prospect. And again, normally the trial court has a trial, develops a record, vets the remedy and exercises the comedy deference. But the Ninth Circuit panel had none of that because it was a premature appeal. And so what they said, the, the two judges in the majority said, plaintiff's case has to go to the political branches. And yet these are plaintiffs, largely uh, most of them can't vote because they're too young. And the political branches, basically the court returned this crisis to the very branches that had brought us the crisis in the first place and were poised to push us over the climate cliff. And so the third judge in the case was Judge uh, Josephine Staten. And she wrote what, what people call a demolishing dissent. She was sitting by designation on the Ninth Circuit panel from the Central District of California. And so this is a judge who is a trial judge. And this is a judge who manages um, litigation. So she started right off saying, it's as if an asteroid were barreling towards earth and the government decides to shut down our only defenses. The government bluntly insists that it has the absolute and unreviewable power to destroy the nation. She said, my colleagues throw up their hands, concluding this isn't anything fit for the judiciary. And so she marched through the legal analysis of redressability of the appropriate role of a court facing institutional litigation. And she said first <clears throat> that this remedy that the plaintiffs are asking for is likely to address their injuries, even though it can't stop climate change in its tracks. And even though the majority says, you know, this, is, this would be a drop in the bucket, this is such a huge uh, threat to the globe. She said, we are peril perilously close to an overflowing bucket. These final drops matter a lot. And then she, she talked about the court's role. And she went back to <clears throat> the institutional litigation that forms the history of judicial enforcement of fundamental rights. And she said, this is just like those, it's, it's a civil rights case. And that the constitution does not condone our executive branch um, perpetuating the nation's willful destruction. So she kind of combined those due process claims and the public trust claims into a perpetuity principle, which was quite elegant and, and sort of held um, the promise of endurance that formed the Constitution's foundation. Now, in her opinion, <clears throat> she went into the role of the court in climate crisis in great detail. And she said, you know, the majority is giving deference to the political branches, to the executive branch in particular, even as they walk the nation over the cliff. And that this is deference to a fault. This, this is not even deference. I would submit it is crossing out the judicial branch. And she said in fundamental rights cases, this is the role of courts to serve as the ultimate backstop. She also, as a trial judge, thought that plaintiff's request for a plan was not anything out of the ordinary. It's not novel. It is judicially um, uh, practical. And I think that if I were to analyze this difference between the judges, I might say that as a trial judge, Perhaps her trial court experience made this case less abstract for her. So she could actually see how a court would deal um, with devising a remedy. Now I'm going to depart from Juliana just for a moment because yesterday the Oregon atmospheric trust litigation came out, the, the decision from the Oregon Supreme Court. And this reflects absolutely the same judicial divide. 
where the majority of justices found there's no role for the courts in climate crisis. And Chief Justice Walters issued a very scholarly and rigorous dissent that really um, patterned after Judge Staten's dissent, saying that, no, there is a role. This is what the court's role is. And that when a court invalidates legislative or executive action based on constitutional or fundamental rights, it doesn't violate the separation of powers. It carries them out. It re that separation of powers requires the courts to um, force the other branches to comport with the law. And so going back now and finishing with the Juliana case, Judge Staten put a question on the table for all of the courts around the world, not just in this country, that are dealing with climate cases. She said, history will not judge us kindly. When the seas envelop our coastal cities, fires and droughts haunt our interiors and storms ravage everything in between. Those remaining will ask, why did so many do so little? Now in other countries, courts are stepping up in climate crisis and, and cases part of atmospheric trust legation are being brought to them. And the courts are devising institutional remedies to try to force the other branches of government to reduce fossil fuel emissions in time. And I don't have time to go into these remedies. Many of them are very innovative and they're, they're very strong remedies. And we see them out of Pakistan and Colombia and then the Netherlands Supreme Court, which issued a decision forcing emissions reduction of 25% within basically a year. Um, so these decisions really indicate that courts around the country know that the political branches are pushing them into um, irreversible catastrophe and that they have to step up. And so they are stepping up and they are rejecting the same political question arguments that are, are causing these majority uh, of judges in the United States to refrain from taking any role. <clears throat> so I've got just a few minutes left and um, I'm gonna finish by asking what does the judicial branch bring to this climate emergency? Again, we are only here because of the failure of the political branches. The judicial branch brings constitutional sidewalls, backstop injunctions, which could stop the, the fossil fuel industry from pushing and the government from pushing the nation over this climate cliff. It provides a forum for government accountability that is free from political lobbying. Again, you would want, uh, you would want the political branches to work, but since they haven't, this is a different forum. It brings a problem solving mechanism that forces those branches to focus on the crisis in strict timeframes. And it brings a rigorous fact-based process. Whereas in the other branches, um, there is no such process, but in court, alternative facts are considered perjury. And I would hope that the um, court processes actually get the Department of Justice and the state attorney generals to view their roles differently, not as sort of private defense attorneys for the government agencies they're defending, but rather as problem solvers that really work as public servants on behalf of the public. And so to finish, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has a petition for en banc. The, the plaintiffs said to the Ninth Circuit, we want a full court hearing, and that is pending. We don't know yet whether the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals will grant it, but I'll finish with the court's roles in the climate emergency. There are really two frames. One is crossing out the judicial branch altogether. No conceivable role. And this characterizes the majority's opinion in the Juliana case and also the Oregon case that came out yesterday. Professor Douglas Kaiser of Yale Law School <clears throat> has said that this represents judicial nihilism, that the courts are cowering before catastrophe and they're denying their power to address the problem. The other frame is this Judge Staten, Justice Walters frame, Judge Aiken frame of looking at the uh, judicial branch in this time of crisis as a co-equal branch providing the forum for institutional problem solving using this comedy deference that I described and traditional legal tools. But on the eve of destruction, the law may only be relevant in the latter frame. And with that, um, I have finished my presentation, I think right on time or nearly. And I believe the 
organizers wanted me to put up this slide offering CLE credit in Indiana. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wood. That was an amazingly clear, inspirational, and frightening <laughs> also <laughs> lecture. Uh, it seems particularly ironic but appropriate that you're giving this year's lecture right before the week celebrating pro bono efforts. Um, so for all of us knowing that while there are there are many, many lawyers who are working on this and some of them are being paid, I'm sure, and some are doing this out of the goodness of their hearts and their belief in the cause. So we thank all you and all of the lawyers who have been involved, as well as all of the plaintiffs who have been involved in this case. Um, I want to note that the attendance code, first of all, that is visible now on your screens is again 03320. You will need to email this code with your attorney number to lawcle at indiana.edu by October 30th to obtain uh, CLE credit. And in addition, we had a question about whether Professor Wood's lecture would be available by video. It will be, uh, look for it on the Mauer Law School YouTube channel. Um, I'm not sure, I am um, I assume we, we do have a copy as well of your PowerPoint, Professor Wood, and um, if it is all right with you, we will make that available. And I believe Professor Wood is also going to be um, submitting uh, a copy or uh, a version of her talk to uh, one of the Indiana Journals of Law. So we have, because it's already one o'clock, time for just a couple of questions. Um, please remember to put them into the Q&A. I'm going to start with one of the ones here. Uh, it says, if the Ninth Circuit agrees to an en banc hearing, could a Biden administration decide not to pursue the case and instead settle with the plaintiffs? <laughs> that is a very good question. That is really in my mind what the Obama administration should have done but didn't do. And yes, that is absolutely the course of action that I think would be advisable. In other words, stop defending the case as if it's an up or down win situation, but start solving the problems. Settle the case, get those Department of Justice attorneys that have been defending government's actions to actually put, put on the problem solving hats and get the attorneys who are representing the American people to actually get in, settle the case and work on the, the solutions because there are many solutions that are viable right now that won't stay viable for much longer. But again, I said that the plaintiffs had developed these um, expert declarations showing deep decarbonization pathways. So yes, I would say that is the vibe, that is the best course of action, perhaps the only course of action. Right. That actually brings us to uh, our last question. It's a, it's related to it. Uh, we also know that the election is about to happen, and many people have already started voting. Uh, Vice President Biden could according to the current polls, become our next president. Um, what kind of pressure can we as citizens put on the next administration to act in a climate responsible manner? That's a great question. Um, if you go back and look at our Democratic presidents and our Republican presidents, they were all to blame for this uh, climate disaster. President Trump is in this unique position because he's right before the cliff, but they were all to blame. And so I think the best thing to do is relating back to the earlier question, which is force a settlement of this case and try to get those agency heads in a court forum where there's a factual process, where there are timeframes and structure and get the solution moving there because the political process, no matter how well-intentioned, no matter how much, how much citizen pressure is probably not gonna work in time. And I want to say, just as a, a follow-up to that, citizens have a huge role in this litigation. Citizens have been joining groups that write amicus briefs. They've been showing up at court hearings. They've been writing letters to the editor. There, this litigation has produced, in effect, a citizen climate movement. That is great. One last question then, which is, how does Massachusetts versus the EPA fit into this discussion? Yeah. Good. Massachusetts versus EPA was a Supreme Court decision that affirmed 
EPA's, the Environmental Protection Agency's, ability to regulate carbon dioxide emissions. But we are years and years after that decision. And even though the authority existed all along, which was no surprise, it hasn't been exercised by any administration successfully. And so I'm not gonna go into the Obama rules, but they were woefully deficient under the Clean Air Act. They don't exist any longer, but those were the ones um, that Obama, President Obama was, it was his administration that was the defendant in this lawsuit. It was, this lawsuit was brought against his administration. That makes sense. Um, being mindful of time and that the fact that you, I know, have other engagements as well today, I want to thank you again on behalf of the Maurer School of Law and all of our attendees for this amazing, amazing lecture. I hope everyone will join me uh, in a round of applause and thanks to Professor Wood. Thank you all so much.